Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, talk, uh, which is part of the Global Design Forum Talks, uh, hosted by London Design Festival and Instituto Maragoni here in London. Uh, it's really good to be here with you uh, to look at bright futures, how to be equipped for a future in design, on sadly a particularly gloomy autumn day here in London. Um, as I said, it's a talk that forms part of the Global Design Forum, uh, which was originally supposed to be hosted during the London Design Festival, but for reasons we all know, things were a little bit delayed. Um, my name is Johanna Argerman ross and I'm a curator here at the Victoria and Albert Museum. I look after the collection of 20th century and contemporary furniture and product design. Uh, I'm also the lead curator of a project called Make Good, Rethinking Material Futures. It's a programme that we launched earlier this year at the museum and it explores the use of natural renewable materials and the future of sustainable forestry in connection to design and architecture. And if at some point you have any time, uh, you can see the first display, which is part of that programme, on the top floor of the museum in the furniture gallery. And we open a fresh new display at the end of this month called Field Notes. Um, the first display, um, oh, sorry, the first speaker that we have with us today um, is Alicia Moraniki Fisher. She's joined by Indy Johar, uh, and they are here to speak about how to be equipped for a future in design. Uh, and to give a brief introduction to both of them, Alicia is the founding director of Migrants Bureau, a multidisciplinary design and urbanism practice that empowers black and migrant communities with a focus on building and educating around good quality housing, design and landscapes. Alicia has also recently launched Black Daughter, a network for black women over 24 who want to build and innovate environmentally an environmentally sound future. Indy Johar is uh, an architect and co-founder of Zero Zero, a collaborative studio involved with projects such as Open Desk and Wiki House, and most recently Dark Matter. Uh, and I quote here, a field laboratory focused on building the institutional infrastructures for radical civic societies, cities, regions and towns. Indy Johar is also this year's recipient of the Design and Innovation Medal uh, from the London Design Festival. So um, you will probably have lots of questions for our speakers today, um, and I ask you to hold those till the end. We will give you all uh, a, a moment to, to ask questions towards the end of the talks. Um, but we will first uh, start by Alicia and Indy giving brief presentations and introductions to the brilliant and very interesting work that they do within their fields. Um, so before further ado, I will hand over to Alicia to come to the stage. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's very big, so bear with me. Um, but yeah, my name is Alicia Moroni K. Fisher, and I just want to say thank you to the Global Design Forum team for inviting me here today. Um, I'm going to be talking more about Migrants Bureau, what we're doing, and especially what we've been doing over the past year. Um, and oh. So, um, yeah, this is an introduction of myself and what I do. Um, I'm in the intersections of green building. I also am really interested in emerging technology, so I work sometimes as an innovation designer. Um, I also have experience and a background in landscape architecture and architecture. And um, I'm very much about building equitable cities and spaces where specifically women are prioritised and we really question what an ethical city looks like for each and every one of us. So Migrants Bureau is all about building um, a culture where black and migrant communities build, design better social housing, community centres and playgrounds um, with emerging technology. And this is really important with how we really think about our future and our visions for um, equity. 
Ownership, collective, and co-design are inherent in how we build and how we design. And they are very much about breaking down the foundations and the infrastructures that are really oppressive. And so as an understanding and a way of which we can still um, innovate and be able to have these really important conversations, being able to understand how ownership and the discussions around ownership and really question who has access and who doesn't has, have access is really, really integral, as well as understanding the collective who are we talking to? Why are we talking to them? And are we even involved in that? Or are we just facilitators? And then also co-design, understanding that if we're going to be designing spaces as architects, builders, engineers, innovators, we have to be able to also empower local communities. And we also need to be really questioning how the economic empowerment is embedded into that as well. So thinking of, of ways in which, for instance, young people and elders are involved in the design process. Um, this is a very big spiel. So I'm just going to be um, a little bit quick around some of these things. but. Um, one of the things that we look at is, as mentioned before, social housing. And so one of the aspects around this is looking at poor housing and um, the community infrastructures. So understanding more about how different communities within even London, Bristol, some of our capital and very dense cities, um, how they are um, building their, their, their housing markets, but also the issues around maintenance, which is a really, really big if issue. Um, and then also understanding kind of like constraints, why people move to different areas, why they choose to um, move in a certain specific um, space and who they bring along with them. So a lot of migrant communities, for instance, even mine, I'm Nigerian and I'm from a Yoruba tribe. Whenever I move to an area, I'm always looking for the infrastructures of, for instance, Nigerian food or Nigerian cultures. And that's just a way in which I feel at home. There are some other people who need basic infrastructures like that, and there are some people who don't. But one thing that's really important is if we are designing for the future, we are taking into account these kind of really important infrastructural um, necessities. So this is a quotation from a resident on one of the social housing um, projects that we're currently undertaking. And they mentioned that they don't listen to us. This is the gutter around here. This is the slums. No one listens to us. This is why. They see us, and they think that we're not important enough. And this is, again, why the importance of empowerment, the importance of collectivity, ownership, co-design is very, very important. Making sure that we design with residences, making sure that they are empowered, making sure that they actually have a voice, and also thinking of ways in which we can experiment together. One of the projects that um, I've been working on specifically has been looking at breastfeeding in public spaces and looking at AI to accelerate that data. And this is, again, a very important um, topic, but a really important um, area that I'm trying to transform in terms of gender equity. So one of the projects that we did back in 2018 was all about looking at ways in which um, we can build with the lens of um, gender. And this specific project now is looking at women's equity, really hounding down on how women are focused, and also looking at the ways in which mothers from black and migrant communities are, again, protected and also respected um, in the public sphere. So um, one of the markets that is really important for um, the journey that I'm taking is understanding more about femtech. So that's all to do with um, women-empowered technology and looking at the market strengths with that. And then also looking at healthcare and then also con construction. So construction is a major aspect of the markets that we're going into, especially because it is very much design facilitated. Um, but also really understanding how health, I think we can all probably agree that health has been the biggest, one of the biggest kind of aspects of our lives over the past two, three years, especially due to the pandemic, whether it's us being locked in our houses like animals, or just being, um, yeah, kind of unfortunately ill sometimes. So um, healthcare is going to be something that I think, especially as students, young people, builders, innovators, that's going to be a def a definitely a, a really big aspect that we want to kind of delve into.
So a little bit more, um, just just um, also explaining that Migrants Bureau is basically trying to pioneer more towards a femtech revolution and understanding the opportunities at hand. Um, one of the questions I actually want to ask all of you is, please raise your hand if you have ever been in a city or a space where you have felt unsafe. Okay, brilliant. Um, please raise your hand if you have ever been in a city or, or a space where you have witnessed someone safety be um, violated. Okay, cool. And please raise your hand lastly if you've ever been in a space where you've witnessed or you have come across a woman's safety be compromised or violated. Okay, great. So we're all, most of us, not all, but we're mostly aware of how our safety and other people's safety is a, is a very big priority in how we design for the future. And really thinking about ways in which, um, specifically for Migrants Bureau over the next three years, that we focus more on women's equity and how we build the frontiers of that, but also the foundations. Um, and also with any kind of movement or kind of um, project, sometimes there's a bit of resistance, but it's really, really important to understand why and how this came about. And this, again, is all to do with one of the projects I'm going to be um, mentioning in a bit, which is to do with gender equity and how we started really learning about, okay, so what are the issues that are at hand within London and also Beirut, Sweden, all these different spaces, but then also understanding now, like, okay, with women at the forefront, how do we make sure that women's safety is a priority at hand as well? So past experience, we've done quite a few projects. One of them is to do with um, Alphatech Festival. That was all to do with virtual reality and architecture futures. So we went to um, this amazing festival, which was all to do with the Caribbean and African communities, trying to play into this kind of idea of um, how do we design a city which is uh, fundamentally built by children. And um, it was basically to redesign Windrush Square in Brixton. And if you've ever gone there, it's a bit dry. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just trying to find ways in which we can add some color or add some playful activities that could really enable for young people to feel like they are actually in that space and embraced and involved and yeah. Um, we've also done some other projects which was to do with um, a project in Croydon um, which was really important and we basically did some workshops for I think 10 days with young people and um, yeah, it was a really great opportunity to learn, especially, I think, from their stance about how they can build more and design better in Croydon. We have gender equity in cities, which I've mentioned before, and that was really questioning um, different experiences in the city. So understanding, for instance, what does loneliness look like? Um, what does it mean to be a biological woman? And also really thinking about the different spaces of which women can operate. Um, thinking about trans, queer communities, specifically from the Middle East. Um, and then also there was a topic all about transportation. So the limitations with different transportations and um, understanding, for instance, sensory mobility sensors and the challenges that come across. These are just, I think, iterations <laughs> of the design process that we went through back in 2018, and this was for Sun Design Festival. Um, and then one other project that we went through um, was all to do with uh, gender again, and this was specifically in Saudi, in Riyadh, and we tried to look at ways in which we can really empower people to think about the audio behind um, their cities. And so we really developed this kind of program that was all to do with soundscapes, we collaborated with a group called Idetic Collective, and we built a project and program together, um, which was really amazing. And then we also tried to make sure that Muslim women were centered in a lot of the panel discussions, a lot of the conversations, um, and also the making of the actual project itself. And um, lastly is an engagement report, which is also with community centers, so understanding more about um, the facilitations at hand, specifically in Croydon, they went through a hurdle in the pandemic, um, but also looking at the infrastructures that um, is really a necessity to the local communities and um, understanding the issues when it's um, in terms of like maintenance, but also um, how the communities are kind of also kind of left behind. So trying to make sure that they're involved now in the, in the um, design processes. 
Um, we also have a podcast. This is actually coming out in 2023. And um, this started back in, I guess, 2019. Um, and this was based off the Gender Equity in Cities project, where we had loads and loads of podcasts come about. Sorry. Loads and loads of podcasts come, out, come about. So I think you can listen to maybe two or three that's available on... SoundCloud, please don't quote me. Um, but if you do want it, please let me know and I'll send it to you. Um, but yeah, so we do have this coming out and this was also to really ask questions about the local communities, what is it that they need, and also for them to feel empowered as well to make sure that they have their, their own voices as well. And yeah, the next one that's coming out is, again, as I said before, spring 2023, so hopefully you can listen to that and feel empowered by that. Um, and then... The other work that I do is um, called Innovative Black Daughters, and this is basically a program for and a, and a business for um, over 24-year-olds who really are interested in learning how to innovate. Um, and I think one of the most empowering things about this project or this kind of organization as it's coming about is really understanding, okay, what are the problems at hand? And also, how do we become more involved in a lot of the pro projects, a lot of the experiences, a lot of the programs? Um, hopefully, in 2023, when it's actually fully launched, we'll have a party. So please let me know as well. I'll invite you all to that. Um, but also, it's a space where people can be allies as much as they can be um, yeah, involved in this as well. So um, yeah, I hope this is giving like a fuller picture of my work, but also my Vince Bureau and Innovative Black Daughters. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, we are just trying to load in this presentation, uh, but I will hand over the podium to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, delighted to be here. I suppose... Um, so, the problem space that we've been thinking quite heavily about is if you take a tree outside in the street... That tree is a liability for the local authority. On the accounts, it's a liability. So we as architects tend to draw the tree comfortably everywhere. But actually, in terms of maintenance costs, in terms of insurance costs, it's a liability. Which basically means places like Sheffield will, after every 10 years, chop down all the trees and replant them. And the reason why they do that is because after 10 years, the maintenance costs increase significantly. Yet the benefit of a tree really only starts to manifest after about 40 years. So the world around us, as we see it, we can draw what we like, but it's structured by a whole bunch of stuff, which is the dark matter. How we account for stuff. How we value stuff. The High Line in New York. How many of you know the High Line in New York? So the High Line in New York cost $174 million to make, and it was entirely funded by grants. It massively in built private real estate value, so land uplift associated to it. So all the adjacent land went up by $3.04 billion, $3.04 billion. So by philanthropy, we invested in common goods. And actually, all the value was privatized into the hands of the few. Let's take the V&A. Probably worth quite a lot of money if we were going to sell it off, right? Might have to soon. But if we pick up the V&A and we move it to the middle of Siberia, how much is the V&A worth? Next to nothing, probably because you can't get the money out even if you try to sell it. So the value of the v &A also comes from actually its relationship to the environment around it. Take your house. If I take your house, move it to Siberia, how much is your house worth? Nothing. Because the value of your house comes from its relationship to schools, its relationship to uh, parks, its relationship to transportation networks, its relationship to land markets. Yet, over the last... 50 years, houses have massively gone up in value. Not because of the house themselves, it's because our common goods have become more valuable. 
London as a common good has become more valuable. So the problem domain we're really interested in is this idea of civic goods. We think the theory of public and private economies is an illusion. Like the tree, it spills over benefits. So a tree canopy of a city massively reduces flood, uh, flood risks, heat island effects, health outcomes, all these multiplicity of benefits which are not understood. At the same time, a tree planted by a local authority has a 50% chance of surviving versus a tree planted by local, lo local communities has a 90% chance of surviving. So if you look at trees just from the idea of how you allocate money to trees, you will misunderstand how to create environments. A tree is not just the £15,000 to actually build a street tree. It's actually how do you build care around that tree. So design isn't about the allocation of money, it's about the relationship of care, money, benefits in a much more entangled way. So we see, largely most of our work is about seeing and re-seeing the world around us from this idea of civics and civic entanglements. And I would put forth to you, and you know, just for entertainment I'll flip through some slides, uh, maybe, um, but... Um, I'll put forward to you that I think we're living in a moment where we're seeing a fundamental one and a 400 year shift, maybe one and a 500 year shift of how we, how we see ourselves, how we see the world around us, and how we relate to the future. What do I mean by that? Our current constitution of our relationship in the world is constructed through what I would say is probably archetypically do you know Vitruvian Man, Leonardo da Vinci's famous thing? That is about actually imagining humans as platonic, independent systems. I.e., you can put a human in a circle in a square, and it's perfect. But actually, the science is telling us we're fully entangled. Your microbiome is fully entangled to the context you're in, your brain actually is wired and informed by the social networks you work, work and operate in, all the way from epigenetics links you to context in rich formats. And I'm just talking about a few things. I'm not, I haven't even got into the physics level of it. So when we start to see the world from a different way of being, you have to firstly reimagine yourself. And I think we're in the midst of a cultural revolution, a reimagination of ourselves in fundamentally a different way. We then have to reimagine our relationships with each other. In a complex and tangled world, actually relationships of care become really critical. Because I don't know if I optimize things towards myself what damage I cause you. Whereas in a transactional world, actually what we fight for is optimizing each of our positions. That's how we build efficiency. But in a complex and tangled world, care becomes the modality of how we relate. So how do you build care into your being, in terms of your relationship, how you sit on your chair, how you open the door, how you engage somebody else? We have been turned into bad robots. We imagine the world through a series, a series of transactions and utilities to ourselves. And actually one of the biggest transformations we have to make is a transformation to recognize our entanglement. And in that entanglement, is a whole reimagination of the world around us and how we think. Now, ownership, what is ownership? Ownership is the act of enslaving one thing to the purposes of one other. It's an act and a theory of enslavement. Can you own a piece of land? As in, who owns the rights of the butterflies or the ecological systems? Who owns a thousand years it takes to actually make soil? Or 10,000 years? So I think what we're seeing is an end of a moment in actually how we've imagined our relationship to the world. And that end of recognizing our entanglement means we have to reimagine many, many things about it. And I think we're seeing a world where actually, you've already seen it, places like New Zealand, where rivers are becoming self-sovereign. Rivers own themselves. You are in treaty in relationship with river. Similarly, in Victoria, there's a forest which is self-owning, has legal personhood. 
So as we start to imagine a different world, it also asks us to how to relate to it, and thereby the role of design in the creation of this new world. Because climate change is just a symptom of the problem that we face. Climate change is a symptom of us imagining our relationship with the world where we're able to create externalities, massive externalities. If I was to take this bot bottle of water and an orange, right? This bottle of water, the bottle itself, creates huge costs in CO2, production, logistics, all sorts of things. Plastics end of use. And the orange will be more expensive than that bottle of water because the costs of this are externalised. They're exported into the perceptibly infinite world, except it isn't infinite. Climate change and other issues are now self-terminating into us. Right? Plastics are actually into our bloodstream. Microplastics are found in most bloodstreams right now. 100% pollution into the ecosystem around us. So, whereas the orange, even if it's a regenerative orange, will be more expensive because this externalizes its costs when you internalize the costs. That is how broken our theory of value is. And our entrepreneurial systems and our making systems are optimizing this and actually de-optimizing this. This is more expensive for you to buy, but this is cheaper for the world, right? This is cheaper for the world, but it's more expensive for you to buy. This is more expensive for the world, but it's cheaper for you. Amen. So this is a fundamental shift in how we see the world. Who here believes electric vehicles are the future? Come on, put your hands up. Don't hide. Right, and if I was to say to you, have a look at the amount it takes a thousand litres of a massive oversized bulldozer of fuel thousand liters just to make just the fuel of that bulldozer to make one battery for a tesla a thousand liters and i haven't talked about all the other systems so when you look at the total system cost of electric vehicle it's almost certainly not the future it's electric bikes electric bikes are going to transform our cities because what they'll do is effectively to transform. We still have the economic geography that we have in the London in terms of being able to travel, but actually they're so much more efficient by per mile in terms of total system cost. But actually what's being sold to us is electric vehicles because car companies and they are able to create the marketing and the landscape to it, and we don't take a system cost view. So if you want to imagine the world around us, we have to reimagine our theory of value. We have to reimagine how we relate to it. So if you're going to make things out of timber, in order to actually make things out of timber, which is actually going to sequester carbon and hold it in there, it has to survive 100 years. 100 years. If it doesn't, and you release that carbon dioxide back into the world, it's got zero value in terms of carbon dioxide, in, in terms of actual... Uh, climate change effects. Virtually zero value. So we then have to start to think about the provenance of materials and how we construct and how we, where we use materials and what materials we use. And that also requires us to not only change our material economy, but our relationship with the environment and our relationship of care in how we construct that. So that's the sort of work we're really interested in, is the dark matter and actually how do you construct a whole new idea of the of materials and objects and flows around us. With that, I thank you. Um, thank you so much to the two of you for those very thought-provoking uh, introductions and presentations. I think that we all learned quite a lot from them and, and some perspectives that maybe we haven't thought of previously, so thank you. Um, one thing that really strikes me in what you both spoke about um, is, I guess, in some ways, a new economy around design and architecture. Um, and it's a quite straightforward question, but how do you go about doing your practice within this new economy that you're speaking about and who are your clients are they uh, you speak about community projects alicia you speak on a kind of maybe 
bigger governmental level, um, uh, but also local councils. So can, can you both speak a little bit to this about who are your clients and where does the funding for this kind of very urgent and important thinking come from? Um, you, you touch on a kind of private, public kind of, well, that, that doesn't exist, but yeah, beyond that. So it's interesting to, for me to kind of start there at, at the economy and client, which seem to be kind of the beginning of anyone's design journey. How am I going to make my living and who am I going to work for and on behalf of? <laughs> um, I think I can only come from my experience, but I think... Um, one of the things that I have mentioned and others have mentioned on a podcast that's all to do with Design for Planet and that's to do with the Design Council has been this understanding that we have to kind of look at things outside of just designing a building. We have to be able to um, start looking at ways in which we understand this kind of, or we kind of break down the client. And um, I think one of the things that I've had to do, especially in the last year, is think of myself as a client and to look at my communities and really ask them the questions that I would ask anyone else and think of ways in which that could be my starting point. And I think one thing that we have um, is when you do build community, you have trust and you have... as. Um, as mentioned by Indy, is care. And that's really imperative because no one is really going to be able to facilitate in the ways that you do, especially with the communities that you've engaged with. So it's really important that you are able to not just get them on board, but you're able to encourage them to speak up for themselves. And I think that does wonders because that already ties down a lot of the kind of infrastructure issues when it comes to local councils. So we do have projects with local councils and it can be contentious. Um, and I think at the moment there are different, you know, councils that are trying to do some great work, but it is a very bureaucratic space. And so one thing that if you are a young person is to just start. I think starting is the, the position that allows you to understand more about your creativity, but also understand your communities. And your client could even be like your parents. <laughs> like, what is it that's happening in your parents' lives that maybe you could design for? And that could be a test bed. It doesn't necessarily have to come with funding or anything like that, but that could be an example. And um, I think just getting yourself out there as a young person or just a designer, innovator, whoever you are, is really important. So, for instance, there's no reason why one of you who's doing amazing work can't be seeing where I am in the, ne in the next year, you know what I mean? So, um, I think, I hope that answers your questions about this new economy. I do think the new economy um, is a stressed economy. And I just want to really point um, a caution to that because we are moving towards um, this economy which is very overstressed and there are some forces, um, whether undercover or around, that um, is going to pull you at different, different levels and it's really important to make sure that you have um, people who are well experienced or um, experts in their field who can help you on that journey. Um, so I hope, that, I hope that's helpful in some respect. Indy, do you want to comment? Yeah, no, totally. Um, I suppose I come at, come at it from a perspective, which is that pretty much everything around you is non-real at this moment in time. Pretty much everything you touch belongs to an old world which is dying, and it's not viable. That's the point I was trying to make. The can of Coke versus the orange. The world is full of cans of Coke. Everything around you is about to be wiped out in a kind of extinction level event. And it's going to happen in your lifetimes, all of us. And so first thing is, and I think, frankly, the capital class understand this now. Right? This is no longer us persuading somebody more and more they understand what's going on. 
I think actually the greatest holdback is us right now. I don't think we're creating enough value. I don't think we're pushing what needs to be done hard enough. I don't think we're pushing our thesis of what the future looks like. I think this is much more of an internal issue between in our design economy and what we, how we internally are thinking about the future than it is actually about clients and partners. More and more, we're seeing partners recognize the systemic changes that are coming on. You can go to the big corporations, some of the largest corporations like, you know, uh, that use 1% of the world's timber. They know that whole economy is gone. So the question for me is much more actually about us. Are we imagining the new design economy? And that new design economy will have to massively reduce our material economy. It will massively have to be circular. It will have to be durable. It will have to have a new material provenance to it. Intangible value will have to be much higher. Um, we will change to biomaterial economy almost certainly. What does that look like? Everything around us is about to change. Our food systems are about to change radically. You can pretty much touch anything and it's going to change. So I, I don't think this is any longer a problem of, of trying to build the case. I think we have to start to create the future more meaningfully. And one thing I'd say, and this is slightly controversial, I actually think we've become... I can have more difficult progressive conversations outside Europe and the US in under an hour, and it would take me months to have those conversations in Europe. And I think this is a real worry. I don't think we're listening to the scale of change that's coming. We're trying to resist it. And some of the things we you know, joke about, about the Middle East, the speed at which they are willing to hear, willing to see, and they're willing to move. I think we've become scared of the future. In fact, I would. Who's seen a future amount, sort of future portfolio that you really thought was really wow? This is the future, rather than just the past regurgitated. And I do think we have a real problem there, and I think we have to start to really push push that issue much deeper. Indeed, very provocative, but important to hear. Um, we are sadly, I'm being flagged up a little bit, running out of time. I'm just pre-warning you that there will be some notices going off at the VNA soon to tell us to leave. So uh, we will uh, try and give some more space to these very important topics before we do. Um, and I just want to double check very quickly. Are there any questions from the room so I can sort of just plan? There's about one there. Okay. We, I, no, so hold on, I, I, will, I will come to you in a minute because I just wanted to ask one more question from the two of you. And it's this thing of, I, I presume that we have a room full of desi potential designers or designers, desi people who are studying design or areas connected to it. So I think that with those provocative um, comments that you come out with, Indy, that I think we all should listen to and consider, um, what role should people just setting out into the world of design, uh, what, what should they think about and how can they scale up to meet these new challenges? What, what would be your kind of more pragmatic um, input to them at this point in time? Yeah, so I would say the future of design is at the intersection of law, new monetary theory, new language and storytelling and a new materiality. That's really where I'd put the money for a moment. And if you aren't embracing those issues, I think that's where the intersectional value of design is going to emerge. I'd really put, really put, and then actually a whole new relationship of care, all these other things start to become very central. And so I, you know, I loved it that you, uh, Alicia, you had the polymath um, in your, I think that's right. Design is about polymathic capabilities. Design is about actually sitting at the synthesis of multiple disciplines and be able to actually take those polymathic capabilities and build new futures. Unfortunately, the future of architecture isn't about structures and environmental design and material design only. 
it's also about these other factors. And unless you're thinking about those other factors, I don't think you can see the future as it's coming at us. I think also, um, I think it's really important to look at ways in which you can understand econo um, uh, economics, because that was one of the ways in which I was able to answer more about the ways in which our cities or spaces have been designed. And I think that can really allow us to understand more about not just financial models and developments, but also understand visions and futures that are actually realistic. And another thing that I think is really important that Indy mentioned was circular design is so imperative. And I think if you're not, if you are building or designing anything at this point in time and it lacks that, then I think you should rethink and, oh, yep, it's gone. <laughs> but yeah, I think you should rethink your, your, your practices or the model that you're trying to create. <laughs> um, just because I think that we have to build with legacy in mind. We have to build with the understanding of, again, again, really questioning who is it that we're designing for and why. And I think we don't do that enough, unfortunately. We're not, we're not very critical enough about the ways in which we design, and I think that is very important moving forward. Thank you. All right, we're ready for your question, person in orange. No, pr no pressure here. Eh? Uh, it seemed to me, uh, particularly indeed, uh, you sound a little bit hopeless. So my question is, how does a hopeful future look like? Oh, I'm not hopeless. <laughs> I, uh, I think, unless we talk about the reality of what we face, our answers are bullshit. That's my problem. Like, actually, the reality of what we face actually invites us to be our biggest selves. That's my invitation. This isn't going to be solved by reinventing the can of Coke and winning a design award on that. I'm sorry, it just isn't. So I think that's the invitation. There's no degree of hopelessness in my side. I think we are in a massive transformation of a civilization where actually we're going to have to solve planetary scale challenges that, cannot, that have historically never been solved before. We are at the birthplace of a planetary civilization not global, not world, but actually an entangled planetary civilization. Jane's Lovelock's Nova Scene, I think, gives a very beautiful introduction to actually starting to think that the planet itself is becoming conscious at the point of our sensing capability at a planetary scale, our human institutions, and our ecological systems. I have great hope, just that my invitation is we're going to have to be transformatively bigger to be able to address it. You want to counter on the hopeful, hopeful now? But I, I also read into that in the, um, it's, it's about the dark matter. It's how we read things differently. And I think it's about inviting us to see things differently. And I think that's what both of you have done to some degree today, uh, making us look at the world around us, making us look at those trees in the street, the 15,000 pound streets in the street, uh, you know, in a different, uh, well, from a different point of view. And I think it's, understanding what the meaning is behind all of that, that also gives some hope, because if we try and capture what one can do with that to potentially solve some of the issues that we stand in front of, you know, there might be something exciting coming out of it. So I'm now putting words into both of your mouths, but that's also what I sort of felt from, from listening to both of you, and, and, and I'm endlessly fascinated by the work that you both do. It's a very interesting, uh, cutting edge that I think we all uh, really stand to learn much more from. So I think I invite you all to engage more with both Dark Matter and Migrants Bureau in, in the wor world outside of this room. And I actually have to round off, you heard the person, the very kind, quite sort of low voice asking us to soon leave and that we hope we enjoy the visit. But before we do, I'd like, just like to uh, invite... Um, Institute of Marangoni to say a word of thanks. Um, and that's Ralevi Berda Levy, who's the director of Institute of Marangoni uh, of School of Fashion and Design. Um, and I don't know where you are, Valerie. Yeah. There you are. So I'm handing over to you for the final word. Word, no pressure. So I'm Valerie Berda Levy, Instituto Marangoni London School Director. Instituto Marangoni is a top educational choice for creative in the design area. We schools um, in all over the world, I would say, in Italy, Milan, Firenze, in China, 
in Mumbai, in Dubai, in London and in Paris. So we are very pleased uh, to have partnered with the London Design Festival for the Global Fashion, uh, Global Design Forum uh, talk in November. So we hope you enjoy the talk. Uh, a warm uh, thanks to our incredible guest speakers today and uh, we hope to see you again for next uh, keynote program which will be in November 21st here in the Victor and Albert Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you Indy and Alicia for sharing such insightful talks today. Thank you. Pleasure.